Hello. <laughs> I am Kelly Hall Tompkins. I'm a violin soloist entrepreneur. Um, I'm soloist in traditional venues with orchestra and also in non-traditional venues on a stint on Broadway, unique recording projects. As of yesterday, I'm a new faculty of Manhattan School of Music. Hey, woo! <laughs> And I'm also the founder and president of Music Kitchen Food for the Soul to bring top artists in concert in homeless shelters, soup kitchens, and drop-in centers. And we just celebrated our 100th concert this past Tuesday. Um, I'm really proud of my Sphinx history. I've participated in several ways, both as the concert master of the orchestra, uh, as a juror, and also as a recipient of the Sphinx Medal of Excellence. So I'm really, really excited, thank you. So I'm really, really excited to host this panel of, a, of our esteemed guests today and cover a really timely and important topic, um, the topic of the 20th century musician, um, how to focus on diversity and inclusion and also preparedness for relevance, to bring relevance to the arts, um, to our society. So before we go any further, I want to get a sense of who our audience is today. Do we have, uh, by show of hands, do we have, um, how many of you are mostly artists? Primarily, I should say, primarily artists. Great. Okay, how many of you are primarily presenters? Okay. How many are primarily philanthropists? Great, can you please leave your name and number and best time to contact you right over there. So, <laughs> um, and how many consider yourselves a hybrid of all, of all those and more? Yes, great, <coughs> fantastic. So um, I, before I introduce our esteemed guests, um, I will say that it is my hope that we can have not only a lively discussion, but also to, um, so I'll invite each of our panelists to speak for about five minutes on their philosophy and it is my hope that we can not only have a lively discussion, but also leave here with some action points to really make an impact and to you know, bring substantive change to our communities. Um, but a little bit of contextualizing of the issue, uh, a few vi small vignettes. So in 2003, I did the Naumburg International Violin Competition, and among the main programs, the many programs in preparation for that, was a piece that I included by George Walker. So I, I decided it was a great time for me to reach out and meet George Walker. I'm really proud that from that meeting we became friends until the end of his life, and I'm sorry that we, we no longer have him with us. But on that particular day, I took him out to lunch, and on the way back to, our, to my car, he said to me, um, do you know this concerto? No. That concerto? No. This concerto? No. That concerto? No. This concerto? No. 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 He was listing concertos by composers of color, and I didn't know any of them. And he said, I'm sorry, but your education is incomplete. Well, I was offended. I, was, I, went to, I said, I went to Eastman. You went to Eastman. You know, um, what are you talking about? You know, he said, I'm sorry, but your, your education is incomplete. Now, I point that out. Obviously, Eastman is not singular in that um, omission of, of uh, works by composers of color, but it is very indicative of the field in general. Um, when I think of an article that I read recently by Anne Majette in the Washington Post, she talked about the difficult paradox, the knife edge that orchestras try to live on where they, um, they consider themselves the gatekeepers of high seriousness while also trying to expand audiences. Uh, Tony Woodcock in the Huffington Post wrote that classical music today is on the periphery of society, and yet, we have all of the major conservatories represented here and um, most of the major conservatories that all have centers for entrepreneurship um, where they're training students in that regard. We also uh, see lots of performing organizations around the country and around the world that bring classical music and social justice missions together. You know, things like Sp the Sphinx Organization, Chinike, Gateways Music Festival, the Color of Music Festival, uh, My Music Kitchen program, all of those sorts of things that bring together the idea of social justice and classical music. So I think that there's a way that that all comes together when we talk about the 21st century musician. So I'm really glad that I have um, our esteemed panel of experts to discuss it further, and I would like to introduce them to you. First we have Paul Bryan, 
who is an alum of the Curtis Institute of Music, a former faculty of Curtis Institute, and now the dean of the institution. He also teaches at Temple University and maintains an active performance career as music director of the Philadelphia Wind uh, Symphony, the Philadelphia Brass, Youth, Philadelphia Orchestra, Philadelphia Youth Orchestra Brass Ensemble, and uh, Drexel University Orchestra. We have Paul Hogel, who started his academic career uh, studying physical therapy, and when a trusted advisor happened to notice that all of his courses that he'd regis registered for were in music, he said, you might want to give that some thought. And uh, from that point, he changed his degree to music and has never looked back. He was the uh, executive vice president of the Detroit Symphony and has also served in leadership roles and senior leadership roles in financial and educational departments of uh, the symphonies of Atlanta, Chicago, Baltimore, and Indianapolis, and is now currently uh, the president of the Cleveland Institute of Music. We have also Damian Wetzel, who was the principal dancer of the New York City Ballet, and also enjoyed um, guest appearances with the Kirov Ballet and the American Ballet Theater, danced all of the major male ballet roles before he retired in 2008. Um, as a Harvard alum, he was also awarded the Harvard Arts Medal and served on President Obama's uh, pres uh, Committee for Arts and Humanities and is now the president of the Juilliard School. Please join me in welcoming all of our panelists. So great, I would like to invite each of our panelists to speak for five minutes and um, talk about the overview from their institutions and give us a sense of uh, their approach for the 21st century musician. We will continue in alphabetical order with Paul Bryant. Thanks, Kelly. So, um, I've been dean at Curtis since 2013 and uh, a member of the Curtis community for 30 years now. Uh, and I can say with absolute certainty that the words cutting edge and Curtis uh, rarely have gone together in the past. Um, but in 2013, we had a really great opportunity to uh, take a risk and reinvent ourselves as an institution, starting with our mission statement. And I'm not sure where that will come up, but ah, there we go. Um, so our new mission statement uh, particularly references the fact that we want to have our students engage both a local and global community. And we know uh, that basically creating the next musical leaders uh, in our society means giving them an opportunity to engage with whatever community they live in and serve uh, and making them uh, you know, really uh, able to create impact in those communities. Um, and that's a big change for us because our mission statement prior to that was to educate and train gifted young musicians for careers on the highest professional level. Music only, very insulated, and now we've kind of tried to do a 180 degree turn and go out into the community and make sure that all of our students are comfortable with being a leader and having impact in that community. Um, so with that being said, uh, we decided in 2013 to create a task force and create a career studies department uh, and also a career studies curriculum. And one of the things that helped frame this discussion for me was an email from Afa where she uh, asked us about what are some of the barriers at your institution with this kind of work and this kind of education. Um, and I would definitely say at Curtis that you know we wanted to do it all. You can't do it all. You have four years, five years max with some of our students. So there is a limited amount of time and space within the curriculum that we can engage our students in work in this area. So we chose work in the community as our focus and knowing that Again, you can't lead without being able to engage. Um, so we created a, a three-step curriculum. Um, one is a required course called Social Entrepreneur, which is very much based in the community. All of our third year undergraduate students uh, take a semester-long uh, course where they dive into uh, a project uh, with one of our community partners, uh, a hospital, a hospice, uh, an educational institution, a community organization, um, and create a program with, uh, with that organization over the course of a semester. Um, 
going on from that, if they are so interested, we have a community artist program at Curtis. It's a guided, mentored, independent study where select students uh, come to us with ideas of projects they would like to have in the community. Uh, we give them a mentor and a budget and have them do that over the course of a year. And finally, our community artist fellowship, which is a one-year program for Curtis alums to come back to Curtis and serve within the Philadelphia community uh, in, a, in a variety of ways. Um, so for us, it's been uh, a very fast uh, pace of change, but a really welcome one. Uh, and I think that uh, having been with some of my colleagues uh, about three weeks ago in Miami, we were all discussing the fact that you know five or six years ago, all of us were sitting around a table thinking, we know that music is changing and we are, we are behind the pace of that change. Um, and I think that we all have finally gotten to the point where we have maybe reached the, the peak and are starting to now have really useful discussions in this area. Um, this is, uh, I think, maybe. Can we get the sound on this one? And if that's something that I have on the remote, then I'm happy to turn it up. But. Uh, the video that I brought is a video of our community artist fellow, Emily Cooley, who is a composition graduate of Curtis, came back to do our community artist fellowship and spent her year uh, working in a maximum security prison, Greaterford Prison, outside of Philadelphia, and uh, worked with an organization called uh, Songs in the Key of Free. And I think it's just a great example of the impact that young musicians can have when given the opportunity in the community. So let's see if this works. Well, I think basically the opportunity that uh, that Emily had was to work with a population that obviously has a real. Ooh, that sounds like it might. Sounds promising. <laughs> no, not quite. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Emily had an opportunity to work with a population that obviously has a real lack of uh, context and a lack of connection uh, to music. And through her work over the course of the year, making uh, contact with a lot of inmates at Greaterford, the change, I think, in their community was extraordinary. And um, I encourage you, uh, all of these things are on our website, and I'm happy to discuss and answer questions after the session as well. But I'll turn it over to Paul and uh, let him talk about Cleveland's work in this area. Thank you. you might have to forward a few more to get to this. Great video here, in case you haven't seen it. Well, you have like 10 more slides. OK, not mine. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is my 300th appearance at SphinxCon. In fact, I've been coming to SphinxCon and Sphinx Connect and all the Sphinxes so long that when I checked into the hotel on Wednesday, a first time attendee walked up to me and thought I was Aaron Dorkin. Every year I stand in front of you and make a report card to you on our progress. I've been at CIM three years. Five years ago when I was still at the Detroit Symphony, I was on a panel talking about the pipeline. And of course I made the arrogant, bold statement that this was not an orchestra problem. This clearly could be placed at the feet of America's conservatories and top schools of music. Little did I realize that six months later I would be a privilege to work for one. So here's our report card, realizing that it is a moment in time, but I think you cannot manage progress unless you are really candid about what's happening. So first let me start off with a institution-wide process that we went through to develop our first ever statement and set of philosophies on diversity, equity, and inclusion. This would seem like a very straightforward process, but to get the faculty, students, uh, staff, and ultimately the trustees to sign off on this was a real journey. And I will only say that this was the binary activity of getting it done. The work is still incomplete, but I have, and I'm a very hard grader, but I have given us an A in at least getting the effort moving forward because we're now using it to guide decisions and to change culture. The second thing I've shared with you over the years is our obsession about pursuing diverse candidates in our incoming classes. 
We have been uh, unrelenting on this topic. We will go anywhere and meet with anyone. And at the end of these slides, I present some of our um, partners. And it's just a few of our partners. In 2016, 17, the year before all of us and my colleagues got to Cleveland, we had 8.7% diversity. And as you may have heard from one of our alums from 2010, when she was in school, she believes there were only five students of color at the entire Cleveland Institute of Music. That was in 2017. In 2018, which was our first recruiting year together, we improved that to 10%, 13 students. Still not a lot. At that time, we were a school of 430 students. So to get 10% in that class, we, we were pleased with the direction, continued to realize we had a lot to go. Last year was a really spectacular year for us. 27 students in the incoming class were of color. I had a funder respectfully call me after we made this announcement and ask me if I was including our Asian students in that. Uh, we are not. That is, that is African American, Latinx, and some uh, Hawaiian Pacific Islander, only one in that class. Our goal this year is breathtakingly ambitious. I would like our incoming class to be as much as a quarter diverse which means that every time somebody points us in the direction of a student who is prepared to win an audition at Cleveland, we go and talk to them. It means helping them navigate through the process to get to Cleveland. And here's the team over here that makes it happen. So we, I've given myself an A. Why not? I, I really didn't get any A's in college, so this is a little bit of vindication. <laughs> Lots of work to do in this. For those of you who would want to tell me that it's not this simple, I completely agree. But I'm prepared to stand before you and every year report our numbers and talk about what we're doing. Number three, materially, by the way, somebody might ask, how did I come up with the 15%? At one point, five or six years ago, I read a study that talked about the minimum number of people in a people group needed to not feel like you were alone. This was not about racial diversity. This, I think it was written about musicians. If you were a singer and you were in a school of all orchestra musicians, how many singers did you need to feel like you weren't the only singer? And that researcher concluded, based on a whole bunch of data, that it was 15%. It's not a perfect number. It's just one that I happen to mentally use. On our faculty and staff, because after all, if when our students come into the building, everyone looks like me, we still have a problem. Um, in 2016, four of our roughly 200 faculty uh, were diverse, not very many, and eight of the 89 staff at the time were diverse. I'm embarrassed to tell you that our faculty number is actually worse. Five of 205 are of color. I'm very proud to tell you that 10 of the 79, as you can see, we've gotten smaller, are diverse. And two of those sit on our very most senior presidential cabinet, uh, which is progress. So in this report, I gave ourselves an F or D. I moved, moved it from an F, a D on the faculty side. And I gave ourselves a B on the staff side, number four. Uh, our board has actually been our most, most diverse cohort. In 2016, about 11% of our trustees uh, were of color and two served on the executive committee of the institution. Today, in the past three years, two of every three trustees we've recruited have been of color, which is great. Uh, we don't recruit that many trustees, so six of the 41, 15%. And unfortunately, in December, one of our executive committee members retired and removed and, and stepped away from our board, who was on our executive committee. So that's something that we need to improve. I think I gave ourselves a B plus. Could have been a B minus, I suppose. This is a list of some of our partners. We go to them. I gave ourselves a B on this. Uh, and the only part that I want to do a substantially amount better is I didn't go to many of these places. Uh, our admissions team went, our faculty went. I like going and meeting with prospective students and their families. I learned so much about what they're going through by spending time with them. But this is a list not complete of some of our partners. Last slide. Some intangibles that we have introduced. The first thing is we put the entire incoming class 
through Case Western Reserve University's DEI training as a class. Fascinating, because they had to go around the building and find all these things that made people different. I was the bald guy with a beard. So they had to find a bald guy with a beard in the building. And so all these students came up, and I had to sign a piece of paper. But it was a whole uh, part of our orientation. We had never done that before. It seemed to have been really effective, and it certainly impacted our students' thinking. We have new groups emerging, self-created, self-curated from our students, which I view as a good thing. We've taken a huge um, approach to making CIM more affordable. We dropped tuition 15% while we've increased uh, scholarshiping. I'll never be probably where Curtis is or where Juilliard is in terms of resources, but we're doing our part to try to make that better. Uh, we are creating real scarcity at the school. There was a time in which CIM was, had ambitions of being 500 students. Uh, we're going to be 350 in two years. We're 395 right now. We'll be 375 next year. Uh, what that means is that the kids that get accepted are going to be in a really small group, so they're going to feel uh, accomplishment for that. We developed and funded all locally a musical pathways project. Uh, we have six students that we have auditioned and are part of that program. The goal of that is to prepare them to win auditions into schools like CIM, uh, and they're doing very well. And last but not least, uh, I would tell you that to this point, all of our investment in scholarshiping, reducing tuition, DEI, recruitment efforts in the minority space has all been self-funded. It's something that we made a priority and that we're spending our time on. Mr. Wetzel. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm going to combine a little bit uh, based on actually kind of where I came into this story. And we all come into things at uh, a different moment. Uh, you know, uh, my colleague Winton Marsalis says we're all born midstream. Uh, we come into something, and I come into this, uh, you know, feeling intensely privileged on so many levels as someone who's had a life in the arts that's been extremely varied uh, and someone who had opportunities as a child to explore and to find things that I recognize in the world uh, is not the case for so many people, and that's become really the primary driver of much of what I've done as an artist uh, in the last years especially. Uh, it's great to be back at Sphinx. Uh, good to see you, Aaron and Afa. Uh, I was proud to serve on your board for several years and to be an advisor and to now partner on so many programs. Uh, really, just all, all gratitude to you both. Uh, so I became the president of Juilliard in July of last year, uh, but I was around a little bit last year, so when I uh, was asked to do this and got the title Walking the Walk, I thought, okay, I'll take you on a little walk quickly of the last year. Uh, show you some things that I've been doing, the things that we've been doing. But again, coming in midstream on the basis of, you know, over a century of first musical training and then music and dance and then uh, music, dance and drama. And I think that's an important thing to remember, that in the Juilliard building, which you're looking at, those three things are always going on at the same time. And one of the tremendous opportunities, especially in this conversation, uh, is how those things work together or don't and how those things can actually amplify each other and give opportunities, in this case for the focus of this conversation, for musicians to thrive, but then in the wider frame, that element of diversity that is present when you have drama, dance, and music, and how does that work for diverse populations in the school, of all ways, students, faculty, staff, but also that pathway coming into the school and then where they're going afterwards. And it all can take place in this kind of magical kind of uh, environment where all these things are going on at once. And I was keenly aware of that myself. I first walked into that building in uh, 1983 uh, because the School of American Valley where I studied used to be in Juilliard. And there was music in the hall as I walked down and I didn't understand even where I was. But I learned pretty quickly uh, what, what that meant to be in a place with that kind of variety. So a year ago, exactly, literally like a year and three days ago, I did my first sort of school event as a president designate and we build on what we know, uh, and that was uh, me and John Batiste, uh, who is a Juilliard alum and is someone that uh, I've worked with in, over the last years on collaborative projects as a director. And John came into the school and we did a talk, and this quickly became a model for how I wanted to start engaging and have conversations on a very open level, but not just about talking. So when we talked about walking and talking, well, 
we then walked outside and we basically gave a concert on the street, which was about opening up the building to the outside, but also opening up the students' opportunity and mind to collaborate with John in a way that was just simply uh, an opportunity, an open opportunity. Uh, and that was, the, that was a year ago, just right now. It happened to be a nice day. It wasn't nearly so cold that we could see there's a little hat here and there, uh, but it was lovely. That turned into the next step, where we started doing, uh, we did a garage concert on 66th Street, opened it up to the community, people came, the fire department came, and it was the idea that the students are actually interacting through their art on a different level. Uh, yes, it's a performance, but there's something more. That's continued on uh, to concerts in the school in, in Orthodox places, that's the, the entrance way. That's Caroline Shaw with one of our quartets. Uh, yes, uh, she also did on the stage, uh, you know, doing the work with the opening to the students and public. But then on the, on the stairs of Juilliard, opening the doors, and by the end of that, people were actually walking in off the street and experiencing this. But more importantly, in some ways for me, was about what the students were experiencing, that they were in a place of openness and creativity uh, that, that was in tandem with what they arrived for in so many ways. They arrived to be to go for that level of perfection, just like I did when I walked into that building and I wanted to do the perfect tondu. I wanted to do the perfect eight pirouettes. I wanted all of that. But then what was I going to do with it? And this leads to our, our, our topic at large, I think. Uh, started a program called Creative Associates, bringing in uh, artists who tend to work across boundaries just as a matter of their practice. That's Vijay Gupta, who will be a, a creative associate for uh, starting in September. So Vijay, you guys, I'm sure you know who he is and his work, violinist with the LA Phil just until very recently, just announced he's stepping down to focus exclusively on his street symphony project. Uh, and all just, you know, kudos to Kelly for opening up that world of how music can work with our communities experiencing homelessness. Well, in our case, we have a, a fellowship program called Gluck Fellows, uh, which give the students in, in Juilliard an opportunity to engage with communities of homelessness, with prison populations, in addition to uh, all kinds of communities. Uh, well, VJ, being you know kind of a, a standard bearer, took our students to Valley Lodge Homeless Shelter on the Upper West Side, worked with them on what it really meant to go from outreach to engagement, how one actually communicated in different ways. He also. At the same time, worked with our students within the school. Uh, so all these things, presenting the opportunity for the young artists that these things go hand in hand, that these types of activities are what it actually means to be an artist. And I would say that also on that, on that score, this again is building on the history. Uh, my predecessor, Joseph Polisi, with his book, The Artist is Citizen, which I read and changed everything about my pathway, the idea that I could take my artistic practice and find other ways to be of far more service and far more engaged with the world around me. Uh, this extends again past simply the, uh, the, the, the music division. There's Bill Irwin uh, working with the drama division, also a creative associate. Uh, there's Shantala, uh, I'm sorry, that's uh, Aparna uh, Ragamaswamy working with our dance division. Uh, and it goes to alumni as well. Just two weeks ago, there's Mike Block and some Silk Road ensemble people working with the alumni on an all-school jam session, bringing the alumni back into the building and modeling those ideas. And we've been doing all-school jam sessions now for the last year across divisions, giving the students the chance to do maker work uh, in that environment, taking advantage of it. Uh, we also have speaker series. I taught a class. There's the great Elizabeth Alexander, poet, now president also of the Mellon Foundation, meeting my class and talking about the role of an artist in society. Uh, Mitch Landrew and Winton, uh, Mitch would came and talked to my class and then we did a public event about what it meant to be an artist coming out of New Orleans and what it meant not only from the artist point of view but from the citizenship point of view. All things meant to te telegraph something. Telegraph what? Telegraph that this is bigger than just your practice. Your practice is part of something bigger. Uh, different, what is the range of music? There's Chris Thiele, uh, Edgar Meyer and Stuart Duncan, uh, goat rodeo people in the building participating in what we call who's in the lobby. People come into Juilliard all the time. We try and highlight them. Usually the students are given an opportunity to play, which they did. You haven't heard bluegrass till you've heard Juilliard jazz combined with bluegrass, uh, but that happened. Uh, again, there's Aparna in the lobby working with Silk Road. Uh, visual art, at the same time we started Juilliard uh, with an exhibit of Keith Herring's uh, artwork in the lobby. Really, if you read that quote, you probably can't see it quite. I am a necessary part of an important search to which there is no end. 
There is no finality. You are here to go somewhere you can't actually get to, essentially. Uh, again, part of an overall message that I, I've been trying to push forward. Uh, there's Keith's Boxers, which sits in the middle of the lobby. Uh, as in tandem with our liberal arts, again, there's so many things, but you know, the liberal arts uh, is an intrinsic part of every undergraduate student's life at Juilliard. Uh, one of our liberal arts teachers, Lisa Anderson, managed to get, uh, over the course of the fall, a piece of the AIDS quilt installed in the lobby. And so we built programming around that to give our students awareness of the loss of the AIDS crisis, but also their role as artists at pivotal moments in society's history. Uh, and right now, we have unpacked refugee baggage right outside my office, which is an exhibit humanizing the word refugee, with architectural renderings of, of uh, homes that refugees have left along with their stories. Uh, all of this was kind of summed up at the beginning of the year in some way, at least in ambition. Um, we kind of recognize that our aspirations always run way ahead of our realities. Uh, but our convocation started uh, with 4x4, which is a group of alumni and current students, jazz and classical music uh, musicians playing together. Uh, it went on to, to have a panel discussion with our new artistic leadership. That's Alicia Graf Mack, who uh, joined as our director of the dance division this year, Evan Yanoulis, head of the drama division, and our new first violin, Aretta Zula of the Juilliard String Quartet. That idea that we are all doing this together and pushing forward. Uh, Anthony McGill played some beautiful Stravinsky, telling us something about who we were as Juilliard and classical music, but in a way that was probing and sensitive. And what I don't have is a picture of Little Buck, who came behind him and danced with, with him. Uh, but he did do uh, a gavotte from Partita No. 3 with Aretta, another creative associate. That's me and one of our young pianists from the jazz division working. Uh, and we finished with a big dance with Michelle Dorrance, the tap dancer leading, kind of epitomizing the idea of dance and music being the same thing. Uh, all of this to say, in one place a lot can happen, but in my mind, the opportunity of it is how you deal with people. Those are all individuals. I tried to show pictures of individuals throughout that, people who have an influence on lives. In many cases, these are people who uh, have something to do with Juilliard, but in a lot of them, it's people who just walked in for the first time and see that opportunity. So when I think about that overlap of what's possible, the two priorities that I outlined when I, when I became president were creativity and inclusivity. That idea that this is a place of creativity, like no other place in the world is my ambition, is the idea that you can have these things existing in one place, but who is it for? What is that inclusivity that's possible? And that extends down to all of the work we're doing and my uh, incredible dean, R. Guzalimian, uh, spoke earlier about some of those things, so I won't be repetitive. But we've already been engaging since September in an intensive look inward at our elements of belonging in the institution relating to inclusivity, looking at our admissions processes, looking at all of the things that we can do to make the Juilliard that we actually aspire to. Sure. Thank you. So in the time we have remaining, I want to really drill down on some of the core issues of why we're here. Why we're here at Sphinx Connect in the first place, um, why we are discussing these larger issues of diversity and inclusion and, um, and also preparedness and relevance, which all really go together. They're all part of the same story. Um, we have here an a, a illustrious panel of the leaders of the top conservatories. They're really the front lines of preparing students, obviously. We have here... Uh, the Sphinx competition, which for 22 years has both cultivated and identified some of the top talent of color in the country. And in many cases, there's, there's overlap with these institutions and, and that they have graduated or are studying at these in institutions. What I'd really like to drill down, drill down on is how do we move the needle? What happens when students leave? And we talked a little bit about this before we started um, our panel today. Where is the gap, and, and sort of um, tying back, circling back to our opening plenary speaker, Earl Lewis, um, he said, if everyone is responsible, no one is responsible. So I want to know who owns the diversity that goes after they, the students leave your institution. So we see the orchestras. He quoted 2.7% and as, as much as 4.3% in, in orchestras today. I'm not sure, I've not heard that percentage before. That's a new number to me. But if that's true, that's really fantastic. But what I want to know is what happens from these wonderful programs 
um, in the gap between that and the professional world? What is your thought about that? Um, I think you said, I mean, I love that you said you give CIM an A for the diversity in their uh, admissions process and in the, um, and then I love how you feature different <coughs> product, you know, different projects at Juilliard that feature, you know, dancers of color and artists of color. But what happens after that? Well, we decided pre we pre decided that all the hard questions Damien yeah. was going to answer. <laughs> I, but I'll, I want, I'll and make, I also want to hear from I want to also hear from the audience. So I'm going to look I'll, at the Slido. To see. I'll make one comment on yes. this. Five years ago, I said the the pipeline problem was a conservatory problem, and I still think that's true. Conservatories, you think, are the for for that for the for the development and the and the training of the students. I'm going to do the reverse for this question, though. I think this is a problem that we put clearly at the feet of American orchestras. The feet of American orchestras. Absolutely. Orchestra. Yeah. Anyone else? Might as well make to? a stand on this. I think, yeah, I think, well, that's a, that's a fair, I mean, that's where um, the, the largest presenting institutions in the country are orchestras and opera companies. Yeah. And they're the, in the largest position to reflect or not reflect uh, the diversity of the society that they serve. So that is definitely one, I think, very critical aspect of I would say that, you know, first of all, I mean, I, I, I look out of my office at Lincoln Center. So I'm not looking at the Philharmonic. I'm looking at the Metropolitan Opera mm -hmm. and the Lincoln Center Theater and at the ballet uh, and the library and, you know, mm -hmm. all of the things that, you know, we are technically feeding in different ways. And I recognize in that, you know, responsibility, but what an opportunity. So I, I would say that, you know, I, I find no no comfort personally in, in looking at, at any of those institutions and say it's their problem. I look at it and I say, okay, what is it that we can actually do? So when I think about, you know, career advancement grants and projects that we do through our entrepreneurship center that always lead somewhere, that's one element of a bigger pie, certainly. But I look at those leaders and as someone, as an, my artistic practice has always been collaborative. It's just, that's what I do. You know, I, I assemble ingredients. We talked about this. It's, it's in many cases, it's Iron Chef. It's like, you know, I got well, yeah. all this, 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 what are we gonna right. make? You know, what, how's this gonna be? And I look at these elements as all of, everybody out there uh, is a potential collaborator. So my, in my conversations with Deborah Border at the Phil, we are talking about these issues right now about how Juilliard and the New York Phil are gonna partner to advance the students and all of the issues of society and all of the issues that she's facing as the head of an orchestra, all of the issues that she recognizes as being problematic and that she needs to work on, and I am her willing partner yep. to try and make that happen. And the same thing at the opera and on and on and on. Right. So I think we have each of us in every way, and this is what, I would, what I'd sum up by saying is that what I hope to do, what I, what I believe in and what certainly has guided me before Juilliard and will, will you know, into the future, has been always recognizing that there's something else you can do. And right. that if you put it on the table as a priority, that this is something important, that the inclusivity, the equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging at Juilliard is a priority at every room for every person. If you do that and you say, and what does that mean? That means you're thinking about what came before, how they got to us, how they go into the future, and look for an opportunity each time. And I'm doing it on my level, and I'm encouraging everybody else to do it. That's great. I think, uh, well, as Paul, as an active performer, what are you seeing in the, um, you know, someone who maintains well, your performance career? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that uh, maybe concerns me about the, if everybody has responsibility, then no one has responsibility. Um, I also don't want uh, any organization, any school to feel like um, now that we've place the blame somewhere else that we don't have a role in this. Right. And I think our roles are incredibly important. I mean, the, the students that are coming to our institutions, we have a responsibility to them to make sure when they leave, and, and I'll talk about that gap in a second, that um, that they are prepared for the next step and to go on to that, that next place that can provide them the opportunity to advance the art form, and, and particularly from the area of inclusion. Um, I would say that one of the things that we've tried to do at Curtis is to um, re-engage and continuously engage our alums. And um, you know, that gap that, that exists um, largely exists because you know, in the arts, um, everybody is so forward thinking, meaning when they're in school, they're thinking about what they're gonna do after school. And when they leave school, then you know, school's back there. I don't, I don't need to go back to school anymore. Um, and I think that it's, it is our responsibility to make sure that when uh, our students become alums, 
that they always have an, a place to turn back to, whether it's for mentorship, uh, whether it's for you know, a connection with their, you know, with their fellow alums. Um, so one of the reasons why we did create the Community Artist Fellowship was that bridge um, to make sure that our alums do have the opportunity to stay focused uh, both on their art, but more importantly on the community. Um, and to give them that maybe next step before they take that audition that puts them in a place that is incredibly visible where they can use those skills. That's great. So um, we've heard a lot about what you think is working and what you're all doing to implement new ideas. And, and um, But Davian, you're new in the position. Yeah. And so obviously you can't speak to the six months before so much. But I'm curious to know what you all think is not working or what has not worked in terms of preparedness and then similarly, uh, I guess, in a related way, going also back to our speaker, Earl Lewis, who said that if you do not use the, um, you know, the full breadth of society, how can you have a prosperous society when you leave out many of its constituent parts? Yeah. So if, if you have a society that's, that's based on plurality and, and diversity, but the institutions that you assemble reflect only one aspect of it, all male or all you know, one ethnic group or all, you know, whatever it is, um, then how can you possibly have a prosperous society? So I'm wondering, yeah. what is it that you think is not working? What is it that you would like to change um, from your standpoint, from your perspective? I mean, from my perspective, um, and, and having kind of, uh, you know, a foot in both areas as a performer, but also as an educator, um, I think what, what doesn't work anymore is someone who isn't open to having a foot in both areas. Um, and to leave school only thinking about the impact they can make as a performer when impact is so broad and can have so many different ways of, of being viewed, um, I think that's really important. I think that um, we're doing a better job of it, but not a good enough job of it. Um, and that's something that I think all of us can improve upon. I worry about balance. I, I mean, this is a, a huge conversation we're having around the balance of a student's life. Uh, and then the, the tension between that and wanting to do everything, as we mm. talked about before, that you can't do everything, and yet you want to make sure to provide and to open the, these opportunities up, and yet these are human beings. They're young yes. human beings, and how are they supposed to actually absorb all of this and the competing pressures between their, you know, their weekly lesson to the chamber music opportunity to the, the thing, Sudden President's initiative that's like, man, you're going to get to go you know, work with Caroline Shaw and John Batiste, and it's like, how do you do it all and maintain your, your equilibrium? So we look very heavily at, we have expanded our counseling staff, and a counseling staff of all kinds to support students that come from everywhere, which comes to the, the belonging piece, which is that if you, you can bring all the people you want to a, a place, but if they don't feel like they belong there, you, you have not achieved. Right. So in that balance is something that I feel like we need to do an enormous amount of work on, even as we expand. Right. I think here's a question that's probably best suited for you, Damien. Which field in your institution is the most difficult to diversify? Um, drama, dance, or music? Well, I think that, you know, when I look at diversity at Juilliard or in any, anything, and I want to reiterate something you said a second ago, that constant recognition has to be paid to the idea that if you are not representing all voices, then you are not really living up to your full potential in any way, shape, or form. Period. Yeah. Full stop. You have to yeah. recognize that that the narrowness of that of, the, of a previous conception of perfectionism and excellence is impoverishing in, right. in the biggest sense. So when I look at the, 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 the various areas, you know, I could say, well, you know, in, in this area there's a problem with this. There's this, there's this kind of missing that is, is impoverishing. And within music, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, classical music, orchestra music, historical performance, jazz, vocal arts, there's different areas that issues everywhere. As a matter of scale, music is the primary, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, three quarters uh, of Juilliard is music based. Right. So I would say that obviously that takes up, you know, uh, the, the bigger space. Uh, so, you know, it depends on how, how deeply I'm looking, but I think that the principle is what matters, that in every area there are deficiencies that we can address yes, that definitely. will, that leave us lesser. So we have uh, just a few minutes left. I'd like to try to get to some questions from the audience. Would you like to ask? Hi, um, my name is Ariel Shelton. I have the honor of working at the Kennedy Center as a program manager in um, community programming and social impacts. Um, I wrote my question so I can make it as quick <laughs> as possible. 
Um, as a musician, I, I, historically I was trained in um, European classical music, and um, I recognize that there's a steep learning around the history of European um, culture that takes place there. Um, what's been fascinating for me is the seeming lack of conversation on the history of white supremacy and racism mm. in the country, uh, in the culture of, uh, you know, descendants of European people, uh, as well as uh, the effect that that's had on cultural expressions um, in dance, music, theater, and et cetera. Um, in my experience, there seems to be a reluctance to acknowledge this history, um, as well as the systemic structures that have led us to the space that we're in right now. Um, we'll bring musicians to prisons and to homeless shelters, but we rarely ensure our students and staff uh, are taught about uh, the history of uh, school to prison pipeline and discriminatory housing practices that have led um, to these issues. And so my question for you all is, um, what are the conversations like around making sure that students, faculty, musicians are really learning about these histories and this, um, the, like what, where we are now, you know, like how we've um, come from a certain place and, and that is affecting where we're at. That, that's a really, really important question. It's very big. We don't have a lot of time to answer, but I want to hear uh, what your thoughts are quickly, because I want to leave us with some action points. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I'll just jump in to say that I, I, I think, again, without fully understanding history, you cannot understand where you are. Yes, exactly. So that's the motivation behind having someone like Mitch Landrew coming and talking about the taking down of Confederate monuments in New Orleans in a conversation about culture writ large for artists who are there Perhaps, I'm quite sure there are some young artists who said, I don't understand why we're talking about this right now. Mm -hmm. But it is there and it is, it, it is valued, is the point, to yeah. continually do that. It also happens in repertory, and I would say that in some ways, I recognize the advantage of having, for instance, a drama division that presents mm -hmm. Detroit 67, and mm -hmm. people go and there's a conversation around it that is not available if that kind of art is not in the building in the same way. Uh, I also think, for instance, the Keith Haring exhibit was meant very specifically to promote creativity, but it was also an education for young people who were not there in the 1980s and 90s when we lost so many creative voices. That history has to be told, and I think yeah. that without it, our young artists are less. I think, uh, yes. Well, I was going to say really quickly, I think that um, you know, all of our institutions um, can be viewed as institutions that have a significant amount of tradition. And I think that um, you know, one of the things that probably all of our institutions are embracing um, and trying to embrace at a higher rate of speed is just the willingness to, um, to look within, to reinvent ourselves. Um, and that's hard to do in the classical music field and probably just as hard when you add in all of the other art forms. Um, but I think the, taking the opportunity to have some of these discussions that are really uncomfortable, uh, but that ultimately will lead to, institutionally speaking, a much better opportunity for the students. I think that's actually a really good place to start with our action steps. Um, to be the ability to have conversations that are uncomfortable, to fully contextualize the art, the art that we are um, studying, off, you know, performing, and uh, you know, understanding. I think to have the ability to have conversations that are uncomfortable. Um, I think that's one of our action steps <laughs> moving so forward from a from a discussion like this. Um, do we have one? Very quickly, one more question from the audience. <coughs> Hi, um, my name is Makai Glad, and I'm actually uh, speaking on kind of behalf of students. Uh, I was lucky enough to work actually on the Diversity and Equity Inclusion Board with our Dean Brian, and I just wanted to ask if uh, the institutions represented here have methods of sort of getting the response from the students, especially ones of color, on how these programs have assisted them, or if there's like more increased visibility, because at least for me personally, when I was offered to sit on the board, I learned about so many different programs that were being applied, but that were just kind of seen and not, like they, they weren't really, they were felt but not seen, but um, if you guys are doing anything like surveys or something yes. to really get the response of students to see if they are actually working or to at least build that sense of belonging that you would desire your students to have when they know that the administration is actively working to support them. Okay, who wants to answer that one? I can tell you that like, like Curtis, we involve students at the table in developing the policies and the philosophy. We do survey uh, indirectly students uh, about their experiences, and we have focus groups with students. This is a high priority. We're all in different accreditation zones, but for my That's accrediting really agency, this is a high priority for them, so we have to actually demonstrate to them how we're doing this, not just talk. And even though I gave us an A on the check mark of having the statement, 
this, there's a lot of journey to go on on this, so when we recognize that. Yeah, I think actually that's another action step that I think that we can all address in our communities, and I, I call it eliminate the, eliminate the sport of checkboxing. Mm. You know what checkboxing is? Yep. Checkboxing is driven by philanthropy. When somebody says, I'll give you this pile of money if you do that thing. Mm -hmm. You know, take the music to those people, uh, ha mm. hire this many people who look like that, check. We've checked it, we've addressed it. Um, it's not as, as substantive and it's not authentic and genuine. So, you know, eliminate the sport, the sport of checkboxing, <laughs> the ability to have difficult conversations about the context in which um, some of the, the culture of the, the art form that we love so much. And is there one more action step that we can take from this discussion today into the communities um, about really how to move the needle beyond 22 years of the Sphinx competition, your terrific and illustrious graduates, um, and moving into the 21st century. What's the number one thing we can leave everyone with? Hmm. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm shocked we haven't talked more about faculty. Faculty. And, until my students walk into our building and see faculty members who, who look more like them on every, everything from theory to eurythmics to studio teaching, I think we still have a problem. There we have it. So yeah. we, have three, we have three action steps that we can all take with us and think more about. Um, we can diversify the faculty of our institutions, and I would probably say that goes to leadership positions of the presenting organizations as well, obviously. Um, we can eliminate the sport of checkboxing <laughs> um, and really develop more substantive programs that are really geared towards change and not just the appearance or illusion of change. Um, and then also be willing to have the difficult conversations about how we move past some of the cultural difficulties of the form that we, the art form that we love, mm. um, so that we're fully honest about um, how it came to be, how it traditionally excludes people, but how that's not necessarily, um, mm. you know, the the only way to move forward. Very Great. Good. Thank you again uh, to our panel, Paul Bryan, Paul Hogel, and Damian Wetzel. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you.